The United States saw states open back up and the economy tried to kick back into the same gear of mediocrity it was at before the pandemic. And if you looked at the streets of most American cities, it would seem as if we had defeated the virus and the vaccine wasn't really a vaccine, but instead just a whole lot of commerce. But of course, that's not entirely true, right? America, as it enjoys its beach vacations and outdoor dining, is seeing a rise in the number of SARS-CoV-2 cases. And since there's been an increase in outdoor and indoor large group activity, the number of cases are rising in virtually every state. Vacationing Americans went to more liberally open spaces and then returned to their own states. Now, this meant that there are more people getting tests, and that is going to mean that there are more positive results. This is how statistics works. And if you spend a week in Florida, you should definitely get tested for more than just SARS-CoV-2. You know, we, we still haven't figured out what causes people to become Florida people yet. Okay, we don't need another pandemic, especially a Floridian one. Now, Trump has been rather verbally aggressive about defeating this virus, right? He claims that we are going to turn this virus into dust. Huh, you hear that? You microscopic life form with no ears. Now, Trump also said we should stop testing so we don't see a rise in positive cases, which makes America look bad. You guys, testing isn't making America great. It's making America look like what we actually are. An over-nationalistic, greed-driven, vapid piles of human hubris that nobody wants in their countries. Because the borders are closing up to American travelers. Now, by botching this response, the, pan the Trump administration and the neoliberals have turned America into the newest shithole country. Now, with all these statements, Trump currently holds the record for saying the least amount of scientific statements in one month. And America is going to be breaking all sorts of records with this pandemic, you guys. For, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. America had bungled the pandemic even before this thing began. Right? Take a look at the governor that's garnered the, so much fame from this pandemic. Andrew Cuomo of New York. I mean, Cuomo became famous for his daily press conferences and constant reports about the virus, right? But he's one of the reasons that the state of New York got hit so hard by this virus, right? Cuomo not only claims that this was just a bad flu, but also cut Medicaid, removed hospital beds, and slashed the budgets by $400 million for hospitals. But because he can complete a sentence without stumbling into a racial epithet, Democrats swoon over him like he's a lead in a romantic comedy. And he is. He is the lead in a romantic comedy about a genocide. Now, part of the obsession with Cuomo is that people think he's got sex appeal, so, so they want to vote for him. You know, I mean, this is why American elections are failing because people are voting with their genitals instead of their hearts, minds, and conscience. Besides, if that was really the case, like Tom Selleck and Jessica Alba would have been president years ago and we'd be trying to figure out who the hotter of the of the two Ryan Ryans are, right? Is it is it Ryan Reynolds or Ryan Gosling? Fuck it, why not just go Double team with some Ryans, you know, with a, a nice Reynolds Gosling 2020 ticket. And really, like, if this is the case, then that means America has way worse daddy issues than we thought because voting with our genitals has led to a lot of older, white, wrinkly dudes and one black guy that wage never ending wars. Now, America is also at the very beginning of a massive eviction epidemic, too. At the beginning of the pandemic, plenty of states put a moratorium on evictions. But there was no 
rent freezes or cancellations. So this set rent and mortgages across the country to get backlogged. Over one third of Americans weren't able to afford rent in May and those numbers just keep going up from there. We're now approaching the three month period and most states are opening back up here and these moratoriums and evictions are being lifted. This means Americans who haven't been able to make anywhere close to their full amount of income, barely received any assistance and only made $1,200 in the past three months, have to pay a lot of back rent. And this means more Americans will be out of their homes, living in shelters or cars. And living in cars is illegal in America, which means they get to ramp up police, the police brutality problem with the increased homeless population that is definitely due to come out of this. Yeah, this is definitely going to be the summer of injustices more than anything. And this has already started to happen as families are being evicted out of their homes and apartments for not being able to pay rent. And if they take these cases to court, it either gets locked in trial which means that they lose their homes anyway, or the court side with the landlord even during a pandemic. I mean, this is an economy run on callous greed. If this is the greatness of America, then your greatness is about to have some major pushback coming its way. The only thing that people can do now is ensure that we don't increase the homeless population, which will for sure increase the rate of coronavirus cases, and we start organizing a nationwide rent strike. Now with every part of the American economy determined to eliminate logic out of its society, the cure of commerce will turn this nation into a failed state. The lack of health, homes, and food, the American economy is stripping people of their basic needs. This is a manufactured crisis, and that's about the only thing that's getting manufactured in America right now. Now, if America just had a few places that could be beacons of light on how to work through a pandemic with logic, compassion, and efficiency, rather than hubris and sex drives, right? I mean, where are these countries? Well, Japan didn't lock down its citizens, and uh, so far, they've seen less than a thousand deaths from about 15,000 cases. They did this not just by telling their citizens the same social distancing guidelines and masking guidelines as America did, but also by having a healthcare system that doesn't depend on a constant cash flow. They were able to curtail the hours that a lot of bars and restaurants had, and then they ensured that large crowd spaces like concerts and karaoke bars would remain closed. Now, Japan works off a universal health care model. Now, it is required by law that you have health care either from work or from the National Health Service. And if you don't want either, then you are more than welcome to pay out of your pocket. Uh, medical expenses are kept pretty low because the cost of medical equipment and drugs is regulated to ensure that there is no price gouging. Right? If you are considered amongst the low-income uh, people in, in Japan, government subsidies pay for your doctors or hospital visits. Now, with this in mind and their citizens adhering to masks and social distancing guidelines, it contributed to a low death rate. While in America, there were protests about masks in areas where you couldn't socially distance and a dire need of haircuts so our freedoms don't get besieged by hippies. Now, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is facing criticism for decreasing the direct payments to Japanese citizens to float the market uh, to, out of a recession, but has ensured that households will be protected. Citizens received less than $1,000 in April to get them through as they moved forward in a, a, a pandemic, right? And now people are demanding that more radical economic plans have to be put into effect. And Shinzo Abe recommended that the Japanese citizens start taking care of each other during this time. I mean, basically he's admitting that a government can't financially help and to lean on the power of mutual aids. 
Now, in that sense, the question has to be asked, why have an economy like that in the first place? Why have an economy that can't help out its citizens, but the solidarity of mutual aids can? Now, New Zealand is a nation that has completely eradicated the virus from its borders. In 75 days, using strict social distancing guidelines and lockdown measures, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, Ar Ardern sorry if I fucked that up, uh, has virtually eradicated the virus from her country. She locked down her borders and immediately set up a way for small businesses to stay afloat through the months ahead. Mix that with comprehensive research and widespread testing, New Zealand made their way through this pandemic with less than 25 deaths. Basically, when you have strict measures in place and buffer that with economic incentives and a testing regimen, you might be able to contain a rapidly spreading virus. Now New Zealand is a small island, right, who, who doesn't even seem to be talking about how they're the best all the time while being 108th in critical thinking skills like America. So it is possible that they might be an outlier in this situation. But Denmark is a bigger country, and they're seeing the light at the end of their tunnel too. Denmark was one of the quickest countries to react to the crisis. They made sure that citizens got a stimulus and instated social distancing and lockdown measures. They restricted gatherings to 10 and had widespread testing. By the end of March, they saw deaths nearing about 600 and then taper out. Denmark and its neighbor to the north, Finland, are looking to open up schools again for the fall. They are going to implement strict rules to ensure the viruses won't spread, like staggering student drop-off, washing the tools twice a day, washing hands every two hours, and, and, a, and a lot more. And this is coming even after knowing that kids don't particularly spread the disease as quickly, despite being gross little monsters that pull out every tiny insecurity that you have about yourself and put it on display for all to see. Kids, you know, they, they, are, they are the future, just a, it's a really mean, honest future. Now, Denmark did start opening uh, back up in mid-April as they saw the numbers decrease, but they didn't do what America did by opening all the bars and beaches and restaurants and comedy clubs and virtually everything. Denmark did a slow and deliberate opening with a bunch of restrictions in place to ensure that there wouldn't be a resurgence in place. Look, this is like dating, right? I mean, if you, if you fuck in the parking lot after the first date dinner, there's a good chance you're going to catch something. Okay, and if it's not genital related, it could be tetanus from banging inside of a Geo Metro. But if you get to know each other, and learn what the other person is, is into and grow, then your sex life can be awesome and also involve a bed. And if you're feeling kind of kinky like a kitchen countertop or your roommate's bed, I don't know what your kink is. I'm not, I'm not here to shame you. But there is one country creating a large amount of controversy about their extremely laissez-faire approach to the virus. Sweden is now seeing their experiment come to an end. Sweden's epidemiologists decided that locking down the whole country doesn't particularly make sense. So they put restrictions on large gatherings and encouraged social distancing, much like they did in the States. They encouraged folks to work from home if they can, and even suggested that to college kids as well. They were testing a lot in the beginning, but then decreased the frequency after a few weeks. They predicted the virus would take about 4,000 lives. And in the beginning, I mean, I was pretty interested in what they were doing as it seemed like it could be a way forward for a lot of countries, including the United States. It seemed like logical measures rather than hyper fear-based measures that were being taken by all the other countries. Now, as we approach the third month, of our efforts to eradicate SARS-CoV-2, Sweden has seen about 5,000 deaths, a major decrease in testing and tracing, and a country that is divided in their outlook of their nation's response. Most of the deaths 
in Sweden is coming from nursing homes, which kind of didn't protect too well. I mean, look, they figured that these old folks were walking uphill to and from school, so they must be tough as nails and probably can weather a pandemic specifically designed to destroy the lives of the elderly. During all this, Sweden's economy did well because there were people out and about spending money like they normally would, but the debt toll and the lack of testing has proved this to be a failed experiment. I mean, Sweden's approach was to achieve herd immunity and build antibodies in their citizens to prevent a second wave in the fall. Herd immunity is the idea that most of the members of a species will develop antibodies and immunities to a particular pathogen through exposure. In order to make this work and really use this method to spread, uh, to, to decrease the spread of a virus, there are many factors to consider and understand. It's not like you can just come out and yell herd immunity and everything opens back up and we enter a new world of immunodarwinism. And let's be honest, right? America isn't ready to be responsible with this idea without strict guidelines, considering the fact that the lockdown protesters were coughing on each other as an act of protest. Look, America is a country that needs a lot of hand-holding when it comes to scientific understanding. Now, in order for herd immunity to work effectively, at least, at minimum, 60% of the population needs to be infected and develop immunity to protect the rest of the population from spreading this virus, right? That's roughly 4.2 billion people globally. In order to make this work, that means a lot more people need to be infected. So on a global scale, that's roughly five to six million billion people that would have to be infected. And a bunch of those people are likely to die to protect the rest one to two billion people and future generations. Sweden's result of the three month no lockdown to try to get herd immunity only got up to about 6.1% of the population with antibodies. For Americans listening, that's like way lower than 60%. That's one-tenth of what was needed. But those aren't the only factors to consider. Herd immunity also has to take into account the spread of this virus. And SARS-CoV-2 spreads very quickly. I mean, we saw one woman in South Korea that had infected hundreds upon hundreds of people without even knowing it. This would mean that not only would we need widespread testing, but also contact tracing. Now, the issue with that is what happens to the data after this pandemic is taken care of? Do the phone companies then sell our data to medical insurers or big pharma or even big generic? The pattern would suggest Yes, because capitalism even sells altruism to the next highest bidder. Now, the next factor to consider is how long does the herd, uh, how long does this immunity last, right? How long do these antibodies in our systems last? And right now, we're not very sure. There are reports coming in saying that the people that got the virus back in the winter and the spring are not going to be immune in the fall because the antibodies don't last that long. Not only that, but if the virus mutates, then this plan definitely won't work. The WHO, who has also come out to say that there is a possibility that asymptomatic folks aren't really spreading the virus as much as symptomatic people. So this brings up the question about whether or not asymptomatic people have antibodies to the virus at all. And that's a new variable to consider before we can even think about implementing a herd immunity plan. And because of all this uncertainty surrounding immunity, we have to think about what happens when there's a resurgence in cases. This would be kind of like the post credit scene for the pandemics. And yes, we will have to wait till all the credits are over and done because key grips are important too. Once the virus returns, what are the measures we'd have to take, right? It, it, it'd come down to more testing and a treatment plan. And this means that you'd have to create specific areas where COVID-19 patients are being treated. Again, 
there would have to be a plan put into place to ensure that everybody, regardless of identity and socioeconomic status, can be taken care of. And that's the major part of implementing herd immunity. A plan. This is definitely not a fucking a Geo Metro in an Applebee's parking lot situation. In order for herd immunity to work as a society, we'd have to agree to put capitalistic gains aside for the greater good of the species. That means testing, treatment, and scientific research would be the top priority. Big Pharma and the health insurance mobsters can't try to turn a buck on a rapidly spreading disease. If you do, congratulations, you are now worse than the disease itself. In order for herd immunity to work, if you test positive, you enter lockdown measures for a minimum of two weeks. If not, then you continue to maintain social distancing when you can and limit your contact with others. So if you want to see your friends, it would mean getting tested and a doctor's note. Look, I know that sounds childish, but so does coughing in someone's face as a form of protest and arguing about wearing a mask in crowded indoor spaces. Herd immunity will fail without a massive paradigm shift in the way we think and if we can't let go of this profit motive. Look, and it won't end once we realize that 60% of the population has immunity either, right? We'll have to make sure that the rest of the population isn't getting the virus, so we have to keep strict measures and massive testing protocols in place for safekeeping. Now, I want to reiterate that this plan won't work unless we let go of a profit-driven system we have in place. This will mean that as a global society, we'll have to implement a reasonable universal basic income, Medicare for all, and ensure that those that can't work because of their contact with the public are financially secure during this time. Herd immunity would also mean that during the time of major testing and treatment protocols, all debt should be canceled. If not, then we'd have a bunch of people trying to go to work when they're carriers of the virus and continue to spread it around. Look, I feel like this is basic knowledge about pathogens we learn in high school, but in America, too many people were dreaming about how to fuck Tom Selleck. The answer is mustache rides. Just, just an overabundance of mustache rides. A natural way of achieving herd immunity is a long process and would take just as long with coming up with a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. But I can confidently tell you that thanks to Gilead's science, we are in no way, shape, or form to try any kind of herd immunity measures. In the United States, Gilead Science has created the first approved method of treating the disease COVID-19 called remdesivir. Clearly, this was developed by a fan of D&D and has gained 10 charisma points by doing so. Now, it cost $3,120 to receive the treatment of remdesivir. The drug takes about $10 to make all six of the needed treatments. That's an over 30,000% in profit margins. I mean, realistically, Gilead could charge $100 for the treatment and still come out on top, but they didn't because America's greed-driven capitalistic cancer means that they won't be able to buy a super yacht next year to punch an octopus on international waters, which is something literally nobody needs to do. But that's what happens when you have that much money. You forget how your basic humanity works. Then you go and punch it intelligent creatures on international waters. Why do we even have internet? Who needs a super yacht? Did... <sighs> Look, even if you say that the people with insurance will be able to cover the cost of the drug, there's still the high cost of, 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 of hosp being in a hospital itself and, and the ambulance rides. Even people with private and workplace insurance end up with large amounts of medical debt in America. But let's say you're one of the lucky few that doesn't. What's to say that all of a sudden your premium and your monthly insurance payments go, don't go way the fuck up because, to cover the cost of remdesivir? Not a good goddamn thing. 
price gouging is legal in America, and your health is another way this capitalistic cancer will keep us all impoverished. So, based on the fact that evictions, unemployment, debt of all kinds, and even COVID-19 cases are on the rise in America, is this a failed state? Now, according to Noam Chomsky, a failed state is the concept as a country uh, with a weak, non-existent, and dictatorial government where elections, if they occur at all, are farcical. We have members of both major part major corporate parties declining any sort of logical financial assistance to people or small businesses in America, declining a universal health care measure and any sort of debt relief for the sake of corporate corporations to turn a profit and throw them some money on the back end. So how many Americans can really say that this administration or the two party system in power has helped them out? I can't. I can say that my dear friends, family, fans, and supporters have kept me alive over the years, and especially during this pandemic. I can say that the power of mutual aid, generosity, and kindness have ensured that I'm not sleeping in the streets or without food. And I can bet that that's the same for a lot of Americans out there. Look, at this point, America is very well on its way to become a full-on failed state. Daily protests, which, by the way, were not the reason for the recent spike in cases, but rather indoor seating at cramped bars and restaurants who needed to stay open to stay afloat. These protests are calling for a change to what has been exposed in this system. A corrupt, broken, and weirdly sexually charged government system that is more concerned about money than its own people. And that's where the problem has lied in the U.S., and Sweden, the choice between the economy and safety. What we can learn from the nations that are seeing a decline in cases and starting to see a flicker at the end, flicker of light at the end of the tunnel is that they chose to help their citizens with an economic stimulus and incentivize social distancing and lockdown measures. They also use their strengths to increase testing and tracing to make sure that they can contain and treat the infected. Neither of these things have been done by the United States government, and there are currently no plans to put something like this in place. America is now on its way to become a failed state, but at least, at least we have some sex appeal while we're doing it, right? Yeah, somehow I doubt a COVID mustache ride sounds very sexy to a lot of people right now. And that has been your dispatch for this week. Uh, I am going to be doing some live virtual stand-up comedy shows called The Citizen Revolution. Each week, it's a new topic, and each week I donate half my ticket sales to a grassroots organization, venue, activist group, uh, community development organization, uh, individuals that are trying to uh, do a good thing in their neighborhood, uh, journalists and so on and so forth, um, grassroots organizations uh, and independent uh, media individuals are, are sort of the, the, the bastion of truth. They don't have any corporate influences, so it's up to us to, to help each other out and make sure that we, um, we, we are taking care of each other. All of these shows are happening on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, and uh, tickets are only $5. That's it. It's a $5 minimum. If you'd like to donate a little bit more, you can, but it's absolutely not necessary. The $5 minimum. Uh, make sure that I can make a little bit of money, earn, earn a little bit of an income for myself, and raise uh, a little bit of money for a grassroots organization that I'm going to be partnering with every single week. Uh, we have a bunch of Citizen Revolution shows coming up July 10th, July 17th, August 7th, August 14th, and August 28th. And this Friday show, the July 10th show, we're going to be donating half of our ticket sales to the Tidewater DSA, the Tidewater Democratic Socialists of America. 
They're an amazing organization down there doing a lot of community driven organization. Uh, so uh, if you are uh, if you're a fan of that sort of stuff, please do come to the show uh, this Friday, July 10th. Uh, you can also get tickets to multiple shows from that link. You can get tickets for all of the shows in July and August just by get, just by clicking one button uh, and then you don't have to worry about it ever again. Uh, I'm also doing the uh, Providence Fringe uh, Festival this year, July 30th and 31st at 6 p.m. doing a version of the Citizen Revolution show for the Providence Fringe. Uh, that is a donation-based uh, festival. So if you want to come check out my shows, uh, you can go to the Fringe website uh, and, uh, and and check it out there. Uh, at, at get, make a donation. Um, add your name to the roster to make sure that you get uh, all of the login information to come check out the show. Uh, or you can go directly to my website, which is krishmohanhaha.com. Uh, that's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N haha.com. Uh, grab all of your tickets for all of these shows, whichever shows you want to see there. Uh, you can also become a sustaining member while you're at krishmohan.com. You can, uh, the sustaining member gets you free tickets to the Citizen Revolution live virtual stand-up comedy shows. It gets you unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling uh, content. Uh, you also get uh, uh, some early access videos. You also get uh, compilations of all of my content from YouTube and Facebook. So if uh, if 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 uh, my my stuff is being throttled and you're not seeing it as much uh, pop up on your feeds, uh, don't worry. If you're if you're a sustaining member, boom, I got you covered. Uh, and uh, also, my album is available. Politely angry. That's also available. Uh, that you can purchase uh, on Bandcamp um, for a dollar, but it's also available on all of the other downloading and streaming platforms. Uh, so once again, that website is krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. All right, everybody. Uh, I hope to see you at one of these shows. I hope to, uh, to, that you become a sustaining member or, or download an album. Uh, and, uh, and if you really enjoy this stuff, uh, please do give it a like, give it a share. Make sure that you're subscribed to it on you know, whatever avenue, uh, whatever uh, platform you enjoy listening to this content on. Um, and, uh, and tell a few friends about it. Tell a few enemies about it. You know, uh, leave a comment, leave a review. Those always help um, help these things get be seen by more people. 